This program was made before the Sandinistas lost the elections of 1990. I remember in training in the CIA, our instructors, this was about 65, and the thing in China was winding down, and our instructors were all old China hands and they would over beer at happy hour, they'd be telling us sea stories about how, yeah, they'd find somebody that was just a rotten apple in the team, and so they would tie his parachute shut. So when they kicked him out over China, his shoe wouldn't open, and that would be the way they would get rid of people they didn't like and whatnot, sea stories about, yeah. about the China operation. So. I had a, a CIA case officer uh, working for me in the Angola covert action. He was my deputy. Um, the name I use in my book is uh, Foster, which is not a true name. Um, but he used to tell us that when he was up country in Thailand, uh, he, he, would, he would do figures, 7,000 communist troops, and they would ask him where he got it, and he would just, I made it up. He'd just type it in. There would be 70, and he'd write in 7,000. And th they began to call it in, in Thailand fossilizing was where you just put in figures to suit what you wanted to, you know, what you knew your bosses wanted to get. The Oversight Committee of the Senate, in one of the debates, in one of the heated debates where they're clashing with uh, Casey, uh, leaked or admitted or stated publicly that there were 50 major covert actions going. And uh, mind you, there are 170 countries in the I mean, that's almost a third of the countries are being destabilized by the CIA, by CIA covert action. These policies cause gigantic suffering in the third world. Rape, murder, starvation, death by white phosphorus. Uh, you know, white phosphorus gets in your body and, and the doctors will put it out. It burns from the, the contact with the fluids and it will reignite three days later and start burning again. In the body? The, inside the body. This is what we're using to bomb villages in El Salvador today. The suffering that we, this great lovable nation of ours, ha is inflicting by policy on the third world is mind-boggling. The, the numbers of people who suffer agony physically and morally is in the millions over the years because of our policy. The second in our two-part series featuring former CIA official John Stockwell. We spotlight the Westmoreland libel suit against CBS and take a look at CIA activity around the world. Tonight on Alternative Views. <laughs> Although the world has changed a lot since March of 1985 when we made this program, John Stockwell's remarks and insights are still quite fascinating. John Stockwell, former CIA agent who's the author of a book, In Search of Enemies, and in recent years has been traveling widely in Central America and has lectured on the CIA and the Reagan administration and has closely monitored its activities. So John, welcome again to Alternative Views. Well, before we talk to John Stockwell, here are some news stories. How about them Republicans? We got some fine gentlemen up there in our government in Washington, D.C. The latest from D.C. gives new meaning to that Tina Turner song, What's Love Got to Do With It? I'm talking, of course, about the resignation of John Leather and Lace Fetters, the former head of the enforcement <laughs> at Security and Exchange Commission. Uh, he, it seems like he's been working on his jab using his wife as a sparring partner, whether she wants to or not. Resigned after an article in the Wall Street Journal this week detailed his pugilistic propensity as a quote-unquote helpmate. Now, the Republicans seem to have a problem with this. You remember not too long ago in the, Mr. Reagan's first administration, there was Alfred Bloomingdale, and 
after he died, there were all kinds of stories in the woodwork about his sadomasochistic tendencies. And he hasn't been doing too much enforcing over the SEC. In fact, nothing has been enforced too much over the Securities and Exchange Commission over the past few years. It seems that the SEC and the U.S. Uh, Congress are going through their little mating dance, which they uh, trip out on over every few years, and that is shaking their finger at the accounting and uh, auditing industry, particularly the big eight. There are big, the top eight firms just loom large over all the others, and they're the ones who have the big accounts. Well, they don't do their job too well according to ethics, perhaps, but they do according to profit and according to what's good for business. Of course, now, auditing and accounting firms are supposed to be objective. They're supposed not to be involved in the company that they're uh, working with or on. And so the, it's very important for the capitalist system because accounting firms are the ones that supposedly keep the big corporations in line and provide information to the management so they can make whatever changes so that the, the corporation will be more efficient. Well, there are a lot of conflicts that have been going on. First of all, these very few accounting firms have as their clients many competitors, which provide potential conflict of interest. Secondly, these firms have gotten into the management consulting business. So here is an automatic built-in conflict of interest. If a firm, an accounting firm has uh, uh, an account with company B to do management consulting, and then this accounting firm goes in with its auditing uh, outfit, and you know they're not going to give bad marks to company B's management because their own firm has been doing the management consulting for them. So there are problems in this regard. There are problems on the flip side, which we found in so many bank failures in the past few years. And that is, if a company gets a bad, uh, some bad remarks or bad marks on an audit, they just fire that corporation and get another one, or not the corporation, the, the firm, and uh, they get a new auditing firm which will tell them what they want to hear. So this has been going on for years, and ever so often the government looks at it and they say, SEC, you start cracking down, and they tell the industry, now you folks have got to clean your own house and take care of it, and we'll see what happens later. And later it happens again. <laughs> the old circle around again. Well, Frank, now that we're on a roll about corporations, I have another little article out of the Wall Street Journal earlier this month. This was a, a story about a, uh, a study done for Corporate Travel magazine. And the study said that the U.S. executive working out of town costs his or her company an average of $137 a day in housing, food, and transportation costs. Now, New York City is number one, of course, with an average daily cost of about $230 followed by Boston at about 204, Washington at about $200 a day. The least expensive place, by the way, on the list is the Melbourne, Titusville, Cocoa, Florida metropolitan area. And that still costs $96 a day. So it's pretty obvious that these executives, when they go, up, go abroad, are not exactly staying at your Motel Sixes and eating at McDonald's. Now, the editor of the magazine, uh, Jane Edelstein, says, quote, American business last year spent about $80 billion on corporate travel and entertainment. Craig, we were talking about the auditing and all. It seems that, and, and accounting firms, this is also mentioned in a story in the spotlight in which they, quote, one of the international financiers of the Rockefeller empire, Felix Royton. He says that the whole financial services industry, the banks, etc., are on a burnout and short circuit uh, direction for the whole economic system. And the spotlight also quotes a former assistant secretary of the treasury saying that the banks have just been lying to the public about their up to and what the cost will be. Now this is a function of these auditing firms and they're supposed to tell everybody what's really happening, but they haven't been doing that. But the curious thing is that the Securities and Exchange Commission, which is under fire for not doing its job, retained uh, the major accounting, one of the major accounting firms of Arthur Anderson mm -hmm. to conduct an outside audit of its books. And it's curious, the spotlight says that they uncovered a, a, an expose that a former managing partner of Arthur Anderson was indicted for uh, issuing deceptive financial statement on the status of the Drysdale Government Securities Corporation, a billion dollar financial firm that collapsed last year. <laughs> <laughs> well, 
Well, turning from the corporation to the military, there's a very good article in, in these times this week called Uncovering the Real Defense Chair. Ronald Reagan and the people in his administration will tell you that 29 percent of the federal budget for next year is going to go out for national defense. And this includes most Defense Department spending, all nuclear weapons development and production, and other defense-related activities like civil defense and selective servants. That all comes to $973.7 billion, which is 29 percent of the federal budget. However, this does not include, in these times, points out, a variety of other defense-related spending, such as veterans' benefit, such as security money or money for international affairs that is supposed to support U.S. foreign policy and national security objectives like the CIA and certain State Department projects. Another $2.5 billion goes into arms control and disarmament agency activities that's Defense Department related. Another billion dollars goes to propaganda. 10% of the NASA budget, that is $7.7 .7 billion, is related to military items. So that Stephen Daggett, who's a senior research analyst with the privately funded Center for Defense Information in Washington, says if you add all of these related defense activities into the federal budget, no less than 43% of the federal budget goes for defense spending. Moreover, if you take Social Security funds out of the federal budget, much of which has already come from the employer's contributions anyway and doesn't necessarily involve government spending in a given year anyway, or it can be seen as a trust that's already been promised by the government and is thus not part of a year's budget, then no less than 56.7 percent of the federal budget each year goes for defense-related spending, which is somewhat of a scandal when you consider the amount of social welf welfare programs that are being cut, aid to education, student loans, food stamps, and other human service-related activities. Now, in relationship to this, there was a good article by Archibald Gillies in the New York Times. Mr. Gillies is the president of the World Policy Institute, who points out all the easy savings that we could do in Defense Department spending and all the money, thus, that could be used for other human services. Mr. Gillies points out that since the Earth's life support system could already be destroyed by 250 nuclear warheads. The fact that we already have 10,000 indicates that spending money for 4,000 more in the next year, as the Reagan administration budget calls for, is nothing short of illegal, immoral, so that we could save nearly $20 billion by not building these new nuclear weapon systems. Moreover, Mr. Gillies raises the question, why should we spend $130 billion annually for the defense of Europe, when Western Europe has a booming economy, has a higher gross national product than the United States when you add all of the countries together? So why should we put 6,000 tactical nuclear weapons in Europe, have more than 300,000 troops that we support there, U.S. troops, and pay $130 $130 billion annually for the defense of Western Europe. Finally, he says, why should we spend $59 billion annually to intervene in countries in the third world, like in Nicaragua and CIA-related activities all over the world are budgeted for up to $59 billion. If we cut back on these activities, he points out, we could save $470 billion over the next five years and more than $1 trillion over the next five, and thus we could have a lot of money that would go to human support activities. So this, to me, is a very good defense, a critique of the defense budget and good proposals for a different way of cutting up the federal pie. An alternative view special segment tonight, we want to discuss with former CIA agent John Stockwell the recent William Westmoreland versus CBS libel trial that just concluded. John, you were actually in Vietnam, so you know some of the behind-the-scenes story in this libel suit 
and can maybe give us some insight into the significance of the case, what Westmoreland thought he was going to prove, and what the actual significance of it is. Yes, I was in Vietnam after uh, Westmoreland. I, I was there under General Abrams. Um, CBS did, by the way, call me and confer with me a little bit as they were putting that thing together. Uh, they decided not to interview me since I wasn't there under Westmoreland and they had to boil it down to a selected number of people. But what I could confirm for them uh, then and, and now was that it was absolutely true. Uh, Westmoreland, the U.S. government under Westmoreland, uh, very definitely did play political games with uh, the body counts and with the numbers of VCs and, and communist forces. Uh, in order to sustain support or try to sustain support for our war effort. If they published the truth, uh, the whole thing would fizzle. The American people would say, this, is, this cannot be won. We shouldn't even be trying. The people there are more united. It's more popular, the communist movement there. Uh, our justification, uh, it does not hold water, and our leaders are lying, which they were. I got there and, and uh, all the old hands, one guy, Warren DeForest, for example, had been a major in the Army and then a uh, CIA officer and he's, uh, he retired after Vietnam. Uh, he and I evacuated together and he's gone public so I can quote him. Uh, but he, he's, he loves to tell, he also conferred with 60 Minutes in this thing about how the day he got off the plane and his first assignment to Vietnam and he went and checked in in the intelligence office and the first thing he saw was that they were, they were jimmying figures and telling him what to write and it was contrary to the truth. He, uh, first with the Army and then with the CIA, fought this thing and lots of others. There was a great deal of bitterness on the ground about this. Our government was lying. The people on the ground went to great lengths and some danger to get the truth. And then Westmoreland would wave his hand and just blow away the truth and the facts and the figures and order someone to type in false information to create a political impact here. What happened when, uh, uh, and I, I watched the CBS show with great interest and uh, was, was essentially pleased. The one thing that made me a little bit nervous is they seemed to place a, a, a great deal of their point on the fact that Westmoreland had misled President Johnson and uh, I believed he had, but proving that, you know, do you have a memo from Westmoreland to President Johnson saying we are manipulating the figures or here are the figures, you know, delivering false information? I wasn't sure. When I saw the thing, I thought 60 Minutes could get in trouble over that detail. And then Westmoreland sued, and we have the advantage of watching it happen and then watching him take his big bloody nose uh, the other day and cut and run. Uh, Westmoreland never had a chance of winning that thing. 60 Minutes had all kinds of witnesses that they could have produced if they had needed to, uh, who could have gone on confirming what Sam Adams testified, for example, and uh, the generals and the colonel uh, that, that testified that Westmoreland had told them to falsify the figures. Which was Which amazing, because they were right under him. They were a couple of the highest officers in the uh, command. Yeah, but remember some basic, you know, why did Westmoreland sue if he couldn't prove? I mean, if, if the story was essentially true, you've got to understand Westmoreland was known to be a, a, a forceful personality, the dashing cut of the military, the epitome of what a general should look like, and not very bright. Giant ego and not an intellectual giant. And what he was suing, as I see it, for the best way to describe it was just trying, as he did with the figures themselves, when he wanted to do a war and the facts didn't suit his drives and ambitions, he would just change the facts. And he was just trying by force of personality sort of uh, like uh, a, a greater uh, military personality MacArthur did, just try to change the whole system, just to, to browbeat the whole system through the courts and, and uh, get some, some satisfaction out of CBS for his case. But he didn't have a case. Well, John, getting back to the intelligence bit, didn't, uh, I, it would seem to me that the CIA would have a separate communication system going back to the states 
where they would be putting information directly into the CIA back there, which would eventually get to the president. But the impression I get from this Westmoreland thing that all the intelligence was going through him and then back to the United States. Now, is that really true? Well, it, um, yeah, it, it, it's very political <laughs> to simplify it. The invisible government is a fact. The, invis the, the intelligence establishment, there is influence. Westmoreland, who's running the whole show in Vietnam, and you have all the complexity of, of Congress and the National Security Council and the Pentagon and the CIA vying for credibility for a role to play in a, a show that was originally CIA. Vietnam was originally a CIA covert action for many years, and then the Pentagon took it over, and the CIA is in a position where it can be squeezed out altogether. It can, uh, Westmoreland had essentially enough power to sort of push the CIA out of Vietnam or give them nothing to do. And the politics of we'll do this and you do that and Westmoreland pulling people in, it, uh, it's hard to understand it sitting down here in Austin, but the conference table and the giant Westmoreland sitting there and the CIA director and a little Sam Adams and Sam Adams is saying, but the facts are, and the CIA director is politicking for his own interests and defending his bureaucratic interests and Westmoreland with his thundering personality and the Pentagon behind him, the Defense Department behind him, and all of the senators and congressmen behind him. And just essentially, it took a couple of years, but essentially browbeating the CIA into changing the figures and playing the game. Now, I saw this personally uh, in my time in Vietnam. Another issue that, that compares, uh, Henry Kissinger had decreed that we would Vietnamize the fighting. This was the honorable withdrawal. So we would give them the money and the arms to defend themselves. They were ripping off the arms and selling them to the communists. And the corruption was so total, it was a ghost army that couldn't fight. On the ground, particularly up country, we lived with this. Our lives were at stake. We knew down to the soldiers how many in each company and who could fight. And, and the, you know, the napalm canisters where they were taking the napalm out to use it for cooking fuel and selling the M M16s to the communists and using half of the trucks to haul produce and half of the helicopters to haul dope, and we, you know, we lived with this and we documented it, and we were forbidden from reporting it. I mean, the chief of station, Tom Polgar, toured the country and got us together in bunches and said, I don't want any more reports about the corruption of the South Vietnamese Army. If you send any more in, I'll send them back to you. If you persist, I'll put a note in your file saying you don't understand the situation and you can't follow instructions. Well, you get a note like that and you never get promoted again. Now, why were we not permitted to report the truth that the South Vietnamese Army could not fight? Because we would be reporting that Vietnamization was not working. Henry Kissinger was going to the Congress saying, give me another mi billion dollars and we're home free. And he couldn't afford to have the CIA reporting that his program was not working and that it was wasting money and we were just making Vietnamese rich. And so we were forced not to report the truth, an example of how it can work, the power, the politics of the thing, the dominance of a Henry Kissinger or a Westmoreland over um, CIA individuals. And what, what do you think uh, William Westmoreland attempted to gain from this, given that he didn't have much of a chance of winning a libel suit against CBS? Why did he do it? And then why did he suddenly, a couple weeks before it was to go to jury, just drop the trial? Well, I think he hoped to win, not on the facts, but just by force of personality over the jury just to go in there and say I'm patriotic and I was doing the right thing and we would never do such a thing and have the jury uh, say, oh yes, and rule against CBS. I think he hoped to win, but he didn't have the facts. He just wanted to impose his will on it, in, on, on the jury, on the system, on the media, on the nation. And he did have, after all, encouragement from some pretty famous political figures from the Johnson administration who did testify and, and lie to perpetuate the lie that they had been part of at that time. But he didn't have the facts. John, the flip side of this business about the uh, underestimation of the foreign, of the, of the enemy troops, so-called enemy, was the body count which the United States was turning in. Now, this mm -hmm. wasn't a matter uh, in this trial, was it? No. And mm -hmm. yet that was, there was as much fabrication, oh, exactly. just oh. gross fabrication yeah. of, of that, mm -hmm. of how many we had killed, than there was on this other thing. And I would assume Westmoreland was involved in that also. I had a, 
a CIA case officer uh, working for me in the Angola covert action. He was my deputy. Uh, the name I use in my book is uh, Foster, which is not a true name. Uh, but he used to tell us that when he was up country in Thailand, uh, he, he, would, he would do figures, 7,000 communist troops, and they would ask him where he got it, and he would just, I made it up. He'd just type it in. There would be 70, and he'd write in 7,000. And th they began to call it in, in Thailand fossilizing, was where you just put in figures to suit what you wanted to, you know, what you knew your bosses wanted to get. This is what they did with the body count, and this is what they did with the numbers of of Vietnamese who were supporting the, the communist movement and the independence, the, the unity movement. John, I'd like to ask you, just kind of get a world, quick round the world of, with a CIA survey uh, about where the places are. I understand that Congress indicated that there were 50 covert actions the CIA is involved yeah, in. Yeah, this was reported, uh, the oversight committee of the Senate in one of the debates, in one of the heated debates where they're clashing with uh, Casey uh, it, it leaked or admitted or stated publicly that there were 50 major covert actions going. And uh, mind you, there are 170 countries. In, I mean, that's almost a third of the countries are being destabilized by the CIA, by CIA covert action. Now, there are a lot of places that, some places we're aware of, most of them we rarely ever hear about, some of them never. For instance, now the, I guess there's a, we're still at war with Vietnam, yeah. basically. Yeah, we're still uh, trying to destabilize Vietnam. A few, a few weeks ago, it came out that the United States, through the CIA, I'm sure, has been landing people in Vietnam, and they're trained to blow up places, mm -hmm. uh, assassinate people, and try to foment a government coup. And the mm -hmm. Vietnam government uncovered this a few weeks ago, and it came to light. Okay. Well, the Vietnam... Uh, government has been documenting this for some time uh, and it's gained momentum under the Reagan administration. Uh, what you're really trying to say is that the Western press, somebody wrote an article about it. The Vietnamese have been saying this mm -hmm. and showing documentation of this for some time now. Well, this was in the left press. In the left press. Because you got a lot that. of information there, yeah. of course, and didn't yeah. get anywhere else. It was in the Guardian, but it wasn't in the mainstream press. But mm -hmm. this is exactly what we did against uh, Cuba. Yes. For yes. about 20 years, we would send sabotage teams in. There was even plans to assassinate Castro. Well, there were seven heavy years against Cuba and 19 years against communist China. Mm -hmm. Parachuting teams in from Kemoi Matsu, remember, in Burma, Tibet, Korea. Parachuting teams into China. I remember in training in the CIA, our instructors, this was about 65, and the thing in China was winding down, and our instructors were all old China hands and they would over beer at happy hour, they'd be telling us sea stories about how, yeah, they'd find somebody that was just a rotten apple in the team, and so they would tie his parachute shut. So when they kicked him out over China, his chute wouldn't open, and that would be the way they would get rid of people they didn't like and whatnot, sea stories about, yeah. about the China operation. Also against Vietnam is the U.S. support of Pol Pot mm -hmm. in uh, Kampuchea, yeah. Cambodia. Which began under Jimmy Carter, and now it's become more active under Reagan. And Pol Pot, I mean, talk about a, a murderer, barbarian. Yeah. Uh, I mean, Hitler would have been scared of him. Yeah. Stalin would have had nightmares about Pol yeah. Pot. And yeah. George Shultz had the temerity the other day to criticize Vietnam for trying to get rid of Pol Pot yeah. and his assassins as if this yeah. was an attack on democracy and yeah. national sovereignty in uh, Cambodia. Well, what about Angola now? You actually, when you were with the CIA, you ran the operation in Angola for the CIA. Well, documentation of the right? detail, it's certainly w not just one of the 50 covert actions that's going on today, and 50 more or less, you know, some of them wind down and they start others, and, and uh, we don't know exactly, and we never will know exactly the truth about what our government's doing, but I, my guess is that Angola would be a, among one of the top ten. They're arming Savimbi. Mm -hmm. uh, now, the Clark Amendment prohibited arming Savimbi, so they would be working through South Africa and through Morocco, uh, through Morocco and through civilian links, but arming Savimbi to continue destabilizing the country so it can't succeed as a nation. It's nation destroying instead of building peace in the world mm -hmm. by policy. Covert action, destabilization 
is messing up the legal orders and subverting democracy or any chance of democracy. That's what it's all about. And one of, one of the side effects of this with Morocco, what they're doing, they're training, they're funneling arms to the CIA selected Angola allies mm -hmm. through Morocco. They also are taking some of the Savimbi people into Morocco for training. Yes. Mm -hmm. And of course, in order to do this, then, they've got also to support the Moroccan war against the Polisario mm -hmm. guerrillas in Western Sahara. Mm -hmm. And once again, they're losing mm -hmm. there. So, and then in Chad, uh, Chad's a very uh, complex situation, but is the CIA too very much involved there, or are they using surrogates, the French, there? Well, no, the, C the CIA, I mean, we don't know exactly today, but reading over the last several years, the CIA has engineered two coups or changes of governments, reversing themselves, supporting one guy, and then when he started talking to Gaddafi, uh, going, uh, arming, actually creating an army of 3,000 people who invaded from Sudan and took power, and those, that was what provoked Gaddafi to put his army in there. Then we claimed our national security interests and claimed he was the aggressor, and he was responding once again to CIA manipulations on his vulnerable underbelly. So he had what I think an objective observer would, would call a legitimate national security concern, and we had one that was, a, Chad's a pretty long way from the United States. Well, even further than that is East Timor. Hmm. <clears throat> We've done a complete uh, study on East Timor several years ago. That's the, Timor is the island which was divided between the Dutch and the Portuguese, and when the Indonesians formed their government, they took over from the Dutch. But the other half of the government was maintained, uh, the other half of the island, East mm -hmm. Timor, was maintained by the uh, Portuguese. Well, the people got their independence from the Portuguese, and so the Indonesians decided they wanted East Timor, which had never been anywhere near the, uh, the business of the Indonesians. But uh, through various, after, um, oh, who was the president who's always fallen down? Jimmy Carter? No, Ford. Ford. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Carter did. Yeah, same thing. Same day, <laughs> following their face. Ford anyway, uh, Ford, after Ford and uh, Kissinger had visited Indonesia just a, a week or so later, well, they invaded and mm -hmm. East Timor and mm -hmm. starved the people. One, one between one fourth and one third of the place had been killed. Or, you know, and they, it's been a CIA operation. They've got American arms. And they even found, it was reported in a right wing newspaper, they even found. Uh, an equivalent of the uh, cartoon book, which was mm -hmm. found in Nicaragua, yeah. showing how to destabilize and blow up and assassinate things. They found one in the Malay language in East Timor. Let so there, there be too. no doubt in anyone's mind, these policies, I mean, in Washington, you're arguing communism and national security in Central America, and it's all very academic and esoteric. These policies cause gigantic suffering in the third world. Rape, murder, starvation, death by white phosphorus. Uh, you know, white phosphorus gets in your body and, and the doctors will put it out. It burns from the, the contact with the fluids and it will reignite three days later and start burning again. In the body? The, inside the body. This is what we're using to bomb villages in El Salvador today. The suffering that we, this great lovable nation of ours, ha is inflicting by policy on the third world is mind-boggling. The, the numbers of people who suffer agony physically and morally is in the millions over the years because of our policies. John, what do you think the really big CIA operations are now that are in place? Obviously, in Nicaragua, with the support of the Contras, there's a major operation that we've discussed in detail. But what do you think some of the other major ones would be? Do you think they're in the Philippines or in Chile? I think uh, just running over some of the obvious ones, Afghanistan, uh, there's got to be a big task force working against uh, Libya. Uh, from different angles. Uh, no doubt there's a sizable office working uh, against Iran. There's probably several working in the Middle East. Angola, Vietnam, Nicaragua, Timor. I've read about Sri Lanka. Sri there's Lanka, a, no doubt. Right, it's an operation against the uh, Tamil minority up north. 
a lot now. Some of these things are involved in cooperation with the Mossad, the Israeli mm -hmm. uh, CIA equivalent. Yeah, the CIA at one time, the, the Church Committee revealed, or the Pike Committee revealed, that the CIA had spent $80 million uh, giving it to, to Mossad to run operations for them. Certainly <coughs> a big operation is uh, Poland. If you want to get a taste of that, uh -huh. debate or lecture sometime with uh, uh, Polish exiles in the audience and watch them come frothing at the mouth to defend the CIA. Uh, you think they're under payment? Well, what, uh, what are they? Or contract? What, what's the involvement there? Well, the, the, just uh, deviling the Soviet Union. Mm -hmm. And Poland is uh, an angle to create problems for the an obvious. That would, that would almost certainly be the largest uh, CI covert activity in Europe. I mean, you're not, it's, it's, it gets dicey when you try to run operations against the French government or the, the German government or in England, although they do some, or in Italy, which they've done many, many times, but it's dicey because they are sort of in the West. But uh, Poland is a troubled country, very close to the Soviet Union, with a, a strong people's movement that the CI can work with and manipulate and encourage and I would think Ethiopia also with the dissidents up in the without any the question country. Ethiopia a major covert action what would be the Namibia what would be the scale of some of these operations and some of the things they're doing take Ethiopia for instance talking for in talking in uh, Washington with journalists who cover uh, the the CIA um, I've had some, some of them say that uh, Nicaragua is not necessarily the biggest one. Right. It's just the most uh, famous one because mm -hmm. of President Reagan's fixation and because of the facility of Americans going down and documenting and covering it. The Reagan administration put it up front. It admitted when it first started funding, uh, you know, the, the, the Contras in 1981, uh, and early 1982, and President Reagan, the Boland Amendment was passed. In a press conference, they asked Reagan, are you trying to overthrow the Sandinistas? And his answer was, what would be so wrong with it if we were? And of course, what would be wrong with it is it would be a felony because it would be in violation of the Boland Amendment, in addition to moral and other reasons. And but that was his answer law. there. But like I say, I've had some uh, top journalists in Washington say that uh, they're pretty sure that Nicaragua is not necessarily the biggest one. It's just the most notorious one. Uh, but once again, you know, a government by secrecy, where 60% of our foreign policy is de determined by the invisible government, uh, it means that the American people are deprived of a knowledge, understanding, and democratic participation in what our government's doing. John, it seems to me either I've missed it for all these years I've been studying the American power structure, or it's something that's just now becoming more visible. And that is, I noticed in a magazine called Central American Alert. It talked about the CIAization of the uh, executive branch. And it started listing the people who now hold positions as deputy secretary of blah, 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 undersecretary of blah, 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 all ex-CIA people. Is this something new under the Reagan administration, or has it always been that way? In, uh, no, it's much way? more than ever before. It's happened occasionally. Uh, I remember uh, during the bulk of my career, uh, we, could, we, we knew of one ex-CI person who rose to a position of, of prominence in government, of uh, overt government. Uh, when Reagan came in to rehabilitate the CI and restore it to fullest function, there was a policy of bringing up CI people mm. and putting them in positions. I've heard, obviously I can't discuss names unless someone's already a public figure. Uh, because of the court order, the censorship that, you know, that I have to live with. But uh, I know of three or four who were fairly average middle grade case officers when I got out who are now top policy makers. Well, you see it as ambassadors? No, uh, like you say, at the, the well. assistant secretary of state or the assistant uh, deputy of, of uh, the defense or whatever. It brings the CIA mentality into the State oh. Department and the administering of foreign policy or mm -hmm. Defense Department in terms of mm -hmm. getting the military into more of a dirty mm -hmm. tricks intervention mindset. And so you also it's have a fairly people. pernicious uh, oh, absolutely. trend. Absolutely. And, and you have people like Negroponte 
right, uh, who was right. a great advocate of covert action, although he was not in the CIA. Oh. He was put in charge of activities in Honduras, who's the ambassador, but a great advocate of covert action. If people don't do what you want them to do, you bring in the muscle and kill and maim and distort democracy and throw people out and create a police and have your way. John, there's one other covert action which I've seen articles in Counterspy and Covert Action Information Bulletin, particularly Counterspy, I think, and that is against the Vatican. It's a bit delicate, but uh, they've talked about the various ways which the CIA has tried to shepherd the uh, Pope into being anti-Sandinista, being pro-CIA. Also, well, part of it was they figured that some uh, part of it was the assassination attempt, which mm -hmm, they mm -hmm. laid uh, to the mm -hmm. doorstep of the KGB. Mm -hmm. Which also, we've talked about before. That's a yeah. fraud. And organizations, and working within and strengthening right-wing organizations within the Vatican, which could successfully mm -hmm. combat any moderating forces course, which might be on the... it was a great political coup with the trend of the times that put Reagan in power, and Thatcher reinforced her in England, is to have a Polish pope. Because his, his personality is formed, or if you will, deformed politically by the influence of his view of the world from Poland. I don't believe we have time here to get into a discussion of Russian influence in Middle Europe and uh, whether Poland is healthy or not, which economically it certainly isn't, and repression there. But Poland is not the whole world. Poland is not Nicaragua. And you can't take... Uh, your, your feelings, your intense, bitter feelings from Poland and use that as a guideline for your policies in Asia or your policies in Central America. This is what the Pope is doing. Mm. John, to round out the discussion with you today, you're engaged in some activities to publicize the insanity of nuclear war. You want to talk about oh, your upcoming odyssey? Yes, I, I very definitely do. You know, the question always comes up, what can we do? Mm -hmm. People around the nation, around the world, mm -hmm. are concerned. More people are aware and receptive to the truth than you would dream, but they say, what can we do? And, you know, your imagination uh, is, is the only limit, really, to what you can do. This Pantex pilgrimage is the most fun, most effective th single thing that I've come across, uh, perhaps ever, certainly in years. Just people. Going up to Pan Pentex is this big plant in North Texas where they make five to seven nose cones a day. And people who are for nuclear weapons. For nuclear weapons, yeah. yeah. And uh, then they're shipped out in, in uh, the white trains and the, the, the silver trucks uh, to be joined with the, the bombs and the delivery systems. And people that were going up to commemorate Hiroshima uh, with just a quiet vigil last year, just to make it more interesting, they encouraged people to ride bicycles from their homes to Pantex. And it caught on and people pedaled from seven states. I rode from, with the group from Austin. And it, you know, bicycle, it's healthy, it's fun. And also we could stop and talk to people all along the way up there. We got dozens and dozens of newspaper articles and radio interviews and local television coverage and regional television coverage and national television coverage and international by satellite. This year, uh, groups are being invited around the world to come. And uh, it's, be, it's coming together. There's so much energy and it's so much fun. People are going to bicycle from Japan, from <laughs> Europe, from Canada, uh, stopping along the way, setting up support contacts along the way, bike camping, to be at Pantex for this vigil. We're going to have internationally renowned scientists who will have teach-ins to explain the truth about bombs in the arms race as well as activists. Uh, it'll, it'll be an interesting challenge to the Reagan administration because it's been so active in keeping foreign uh, dignitaries or foreign scholars, yeah. foreign activists, out of the country when it's, they disagree. And yet, you know, you're going to ride bicycles and you're touring. You get a visa to tour the United States and it's legal to ride bicycles. Uh, Reagan, of course, claims that the freeze movement is a Soviet plot. Uh, <laughs> What, we're, what a group of us are going to do is we're going to, if we can get visas, uh, we're going to go to Moscow and ride our bicycles from Moscow uh, across Europe and across the, the eastern United States just to be able to make a point of talking to some Russians along the way 
and just asking them, you know, how do you feel about the arms race and the bombs, and do you really want to reduce the United States to a pile of ashes, which is what Reagan has said he proposes to do with the Soviet Union. Uh, another group is uh, going to put together and go and ride the length of the island of Cuba, and then fly and, and ride up to Pantex. Once again, to be able to talk to Cuba, the other side, you know, an arms race, there are two sides to be able to talk to people, human beings, and try to get a feeling for how they feel about this, this arms race. And when will this take place, these it, uh, Hiroshima is the 6th of August. The, the core, the heart of the, for, for people in the central United mm -hmm. States, will be a nine-day bike ride starting at Comanche Peak, south of Fort Worth, and going past Carswell Dias bases where the, the B-1 and the cruise missiles will be, and then through Deaf Smith County where they're going to bury nuclear waste and then uh, to Pantex to arrive on, I believe, the 4th for a vigil. It will be the 4th, 5th, and 6th. And then uh, there will be some people who will stay on for, for uh, Nagasaki, which, was, which will be the 9th. Well, John, what uh, phone number or address can people use? The Red River Peace to... Network at uh, 1022 uh, West 6th is uh, a focal point coordinating it and can provide information. and. Now, mind you, it's a people thing. Nobody's controlling it. You can get on a bicycle in Oregon and ride, and all you need is a bicycle and a buddy or two and a backpack. Uh, or you can organize a group and have a support vehicle and, and do it more formally and have arranged stops and rallies and meetings. But all you really need is a... Or if you don't want to ride a bicycle, take your van, take your truck, take your car. One old boy and his son uh, rode their horses across <laughs> Oklahoma last year, and two women walked from Oregon. Oh my goodness! Yeah. Well, you got a lot of good publicity. They had uh, stories on the, the Associated Press and radio. To talk to people, mm -hmm. and the media is interested. Believe me, the people in the media, whatever may disappoint you about what they publish, they know about the arms race. They know about these sixty thousand bombs that exist, and they know about the fraud. Uh, they can't always publish it, they can't always get it on the air, but they will come and interview you if you're participating in something like this and give you a chance to say what you want to say about it. Well, I guess we all better start getting in shape now, riding our bikes. Oh, my knees there. are sore. I've been training and riding. and <laughs> Absolutely. Well, good luck to you, John. Have a good time. Come back and see us again. Thank Thanks, you. John. Now for some more news stories. Well, as Ronald Reagan looks for private funding for his Contras. It looks like the South Africans are doing the same thing for their Contras. They're trying to destabilize Mozambique. Revelations about this complex web of support for the Mozambican National Resistance, the MNR, uh, which is backed by Pretoria, have begun to emerge in recent weeks in the European and the South African press even. Now, there was a an accord in March of 1984 in which the two countries, Mozambique and South Africa, agreed not to help guerrillas in their respective countries. Well, South Africa, of course, lied and has declined to cut off all military and logistical support for their own contras. Now, this includes uh, covert South African operations and the use of foreign countries and private organizations and individuals to keep the MNR's arms pipeline open. And they're also trying to bring the Portuguese back, whom the people in Mozambique kicked out a few years ago. There's been several recent articles on cancer research and on the connection between diet and cancer. These articles point out that despite all of the research into cancer prevention in the past and the new treatments and therapies to try to prevent the spreading of cancer, still the death rate from cancer has not really gone down. In fact, I read that one out of three people may be dying of cancer in the next 10 years, and currently one out of four or five people get cancer and die from it. Well, some new research into the connection between food and cancer may help alleviate the problem. An article in Science 1984 in September suggested that new research into the mechanisms of cancer development and on how diet may cause cancer could provide some clues as to the causes of cancer that might be able to make possible better prevention. And in American Health, 
of November 1984, Janet Hobson reviews some recent scientific studies and interviews Dr. Bruce Ames, who's the chairman of biochemistry at the University of California at Berkeley, who believes that cancer-causing and cancer-preventing chemicals occur in most of the foods that we eat, arguing that bad diet could be the primary cause of cancer and good diet may be the best way to prevent the development of cancer. And in the last several years, both the National Cancer Institute and the National Academy of Science have suggested that a certain diet may indeed prevent cancer, which would include less animal fats, more whole grains, fruits and vegetables, more dark leafy vegetables, and less smoked, salted, and nitrate-preserved meats and fish. In short, a dietitian, Mark Maureen Henderson, said a diet identical to 1900 would be the best cancer prevention method, that is, not to eat any foods that have preservatives in them or any other kinds of artificial substances to go more with a natural diet. However, an article in American Health Magazine in December of 1984 points out that there's dangers in at least some sort of natural diets as well as supposedly healthy activities like jogging, which runs a risk of iron deficiency. They point out that too much vitamin C poses the danger of kidney stones, and that even the leanest broiled fish contains PCBs and other chemical pollutants. Like mercury, for instance. Mercury and, and many other uh, pollutants that are in the Gulf and the various fishing areas increasingly. They also point out that irradiation, which is a method of beaming meat and produce with low-level radiation to prevent decay and increase shelf life, is being used in a variety of substances from uh, coffee to meat that could give cancer-causing chemicals that may cause danger in your diet. And the Friends of the Earth newspaper, Not Man Apart, point out that the federal government has done nothing to control the use of these substances in uh, food. In fact, I've seen a couple articles recently about the decline of food regulation under the Reagan administration, where they're simply not researching what types of chemicals or preservatives or uh, herbicides or irradiation techniques used on food might cause um, cancer or other uh, diseases. So that possibly even your seemingly healthy vegetables or uh, lettuce have been soaked with potentially toxic uh, chemicals because the Food and Drug Administration hasn't required these uh, chemicals to be labeled or to warn against uh, their, their usage. I have a little short here out of the Wall Street Journal. It's a pretty funny little article. It seems that Time Incorporated has been trying a marketing ploy to uh, get their new magazine, Discover, off the ground. And they send it around to all these different places where people have to wait. For instance, doctor's offices. Well, it seems a Louisiana doctor, Martin Flam, spurned Time Incorporated's offer of these free copies. Why, you ask? He says he complains that the sample issue contained an article questioning the value of regular visits to the doctor. Well, you may have thought that you've escaped Big Brother because 1984 is over. But in 1984, according to several sources, Big Brother has some new surprises for you. The Wall Street Journal reports that truckers should know that to help companies operate more efficiently, TRW is developing an electronic monitoring system that will use satellites to locate and guide trucks to warn of impending breakdowns and to detect drivers who are either speeding or sitting idly when they should be hauling a load. Moreover, the futurist in the December 1984 issue says that penal psychologist Charles Brown indicates that a wide variety of potential devices are being designed to protect the law-abiding citizen so that parolees and suspected criminals may have to have these little monitoring devices on their cars so that from a central monitoring place, surveillance place in every town, they'd be able to monitor the whereabouts of people on parole. Oh, you remember we had a story on that uh, several months back where they actually have tried this in some western uh, uh, state where they would have a wrist which the parole, uh, a, a, a bracelet, an electronic bracelet which would put out a beep on the, uh, uh, on the arm of the parolee 
and he would have to be within beeping distance all the time or the cops would be out after him. In fact, so I, they've tried it actually. There's, there's even a more incredible sounding uh, example of this for people who are habitual drunk drivers or drunks who get in fights or a uh, public nuisance, they would have a substance control device monitoring how much alcohol they drank or drugs that they took that would emit an audible warning tone and ultimately would release a chemical causing nausea or a headache. <laughs> Happy New Year, folks. <laughs> The uh, right-wing newspaper, The Spotlight, talk about experiments that have been made similar to this in which there are a supervisor in a company or an office would have brainwave interception devices in which they could plug in to all the people who are working or plug into the place where the people were working. And when their brain waves would dip below a certain level, which would indicate they were stargazing or uh, lint picking or whatever, or just weren't concentrating on the job, an alarm would ring and the supervisor would be out there on their tail. <laughs> and right now, even another story I saw is that the, so many of the offices, the supervisor has just a large uh, number of television monitors in front of him where he can keep track of every employee and if it looks like any of them is yawning or looking out the window or something he zaps them <laughs> so big brother is slowly to get near you, you might wonder where all these great ideas are coming from well i have a story that might answer a little bit of that and this is from the wall street journal uh second week of february there's a report by the association of american colleges it says that confused faculty leadership and an emphasis on research over teaching have devalued a college education. They say as a result, employers who hire college graduates are being shortchanged. In this report, it was called Integrity in the College Curriculum, a report to the academic community. That sounds like an academic report. They recommend a nine-point minimum required curriculum to develop critical thinking, writing and communication skills, numerical understanding, and historical perspective. Well, that's some oddball things. I mean, you think about studying uh, business and statistics and all that. Well, the report faults a lack of coherence in the curriculum offered undergraduates. It says, I quote, almost anything goes. The curriculum is given way to a marketplace philosophy. It is a supermarket where students are shoppers and professors are merchants of learning. I see some of our UT employees are having a big grin about this one. <laughs> Teachers, they say, are central to the troubles and to the solution. They say that uh, they recommend placing teachers at least on a par with research. Good teachers must be a measure, good teaching must be a measure for tenure, promotion, and salary advances in order to improve quality, it says. And I quote again, many people have come out of graduate school very finely trained for research and then gone to schools where the expectation is that they will be teachers. That's often a problem, <laughs> says one educator, and I think he might have a point there. And the report is the culmination of a three-year project examining the baccalaureate degree. The recommendations are directed at both traditional liberal arts programs and at professional studies such as business and engineering. They, the report, or Mark H. Curtis, who's president of the association, says, we're getting indications from corporate people that too narrow a training in some of the technical and professional skills leads their employees to a dead end. And he goes on further and says, they've been getting a lot of illiterate memos or ones that don't contain sequential reasoning, getting from A to B in a logical fashion. So you get these uh, students that are getting out of UT, like, what is it, a quarter UT students now are business students. And the first thing they write on their resume is, I are a business graduate. <laughs> <laughs> and that's Alternative Views for this evening. We have a lot of people to thank, uh, particularly those who worked our segment with John Stockwell, David Galasich, Alexander Stevens, Randy Morrow, Richard Palmer, Lori Single, S. Monotony, and the ACV supervisor, Peggy Little. For our new segment, our camera person was Eric Eubank, and Kevin West was on audio. And naturally, we want to thank Austin Community Television for their facilities. Alternative Views is a production of the Alternative Information Network, P.O. Box 7279, Austin, Texas, 78713. Want to contact us? There's our address. Good night.